Then I'm going to begin with a with a video. Uh, when the- Ezekiel, Obadiah, Habakkuk. What do these names have in common? Well, they're three of the 15 prophets that have their own books in the Bible. And if you've tried to read these books, odds are you got lost in their dense poetry and strange imagery. But these books are super important for understanding the overall biblical story. So let's talk about how to read the prophets. When I hear the word prophet, I think of a fortune teller, someone who predicts the future. That's what being a prophet means in many cultures, but not in the Bible. While the biblical prophets sometimes speak about the future, they're way more than fortune tellers. How should I think about them? Well, they were Israelites who had a radical encounter with God's presence, and then were commissioned to go and speak on God's behalf. Like a representative. Right. And the thing that they cared about the most is the mutual partnership that existed between God and the Israelites. Right, the partnership. God rescued Israel from slavery in Egypt and invited them to become a nation of justice and generosity that would represent his character to the nations. And so this partnership required all Israelites to give their trust and allegiance to their God alone. In the Bible, this partnership's called the covenant. But the leaders, the priests, the kings led Israel astray and they broke the covenant. And so this is where the prophets came in, to remind Israel of their role in the partnership. And they did this in three ways. First, they were constantly accusing Israel for violating the terms of the covenant. The charges usually include idolatry, alliances with other nations and their gods, and allowing injustice towards the poor. Ah, so like covenant lawyers. Right. And so second, the prophets called the Israelites to repent, which means simply to turn around. They spoke of God's mercy to forgive them if they would just confess and change their ways. But Israel and its leaders didn't change. Things went from bad to worse. And so that brings us to the third way the prophets emphasize the covenant. They announce the consequences for breaking it, which they call the day of the Lord. Oh yeah, the apocalypse, visions of the end of the world. Well, sort of. The prophets were mostly interested in how God would bring his justice on Israel's corruption and on the violent nations around them. And while explaining these local events, they often used cosmic imagery. Cosmic imagery? Yeah, like Jeremiah. He described the exile of the Israelites to Babylon as the undoing of creation itself. The land dissolves into chaos and disorder, no light, no animals or people. Or Isaiah described the downfall of Babylon as the disintegration of the cosmos, stars falling from the sky, the sun going dark. For the prophets, when God acts in human history to bring justice, it's a day of the Lord. So the prophets aren't talking about the end of the world. Well, hold on. They're doing many things at once. The cosmic imagery shows how these important events of their day fit into the bigger story of God's mission to bring down every corrupt and violent nation once and for all. The prophets cared about the present and the future, and the cosmic imagery allowed them to talk about both at the same time. Got it. So no matter when you live, the day of the Lord's bad news if you're part of Babylon. But it's good news if you're waiting for God's kingdom. The day of the Lord pointed to the return of the exiles to Jerusalem. And once again, the prophets use cosmic poetry to describe it. They see a new Jerusalem, like a new Garden of Eden, with all humanity living at peace with each other and with the animals. And there's a new messianic king who restores God's kingdom in a renewed creation. Beautiful. So those are the three themes in the prophets. These prophets must have been very powerful, persuasive speakers. Well, some were, but others lived on the margins. They would often perform strange symbolic stunts in public to communicate their message. Like when Ezekiel lay in the dirt and built a model of Jerusalem being attacked by Babylon. Or when Isaiah walked around naked for three years as a symbol of the humiliation of exile. So did people pay attention to them? Not really. The stories in these books show how the prophets were a minority group mostly shunned by Israel's leaders. And their writings were a kind of resistance literature. Most people ignored them, that is, until their warnings came true in the Babylonian exile. And after that, people began to take their words seriously. Yes. The works of these earlier prophets were inherited by later unnamed prophets who studied these texts intensely. They're the ones who arranged the Hebrew scriptures as we know them, including the books of the prophets. Okay, and there's 15 books of the prophets. The big three are Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel. And then there's a collection of 12 smaller prophetic works unified on a single scroll. And in each of these books, you'll read stories about the prophets and their poems and visions, all arranged to show the cosmic meaning of Israel's history, how God would turn their tragic story of failure and exile into a story of hope and restoration for all nations. 
And it's that twin message of prophetic warning and of hope that the prophets cared about so much. And it's a message that we still need to hear today. So hopefully that gives you a bit of a uh, primer on the prophets. Now that video is about the prophets uh, generally rather than um, about the major prophets, which is our focus for this evening. But nonetheless, I think it's pretty useful in terms of um, giving us some, some basic ideas about, about the prophets. Um, so let me ask you a question. Um, when you think of prophecy and prophets and that kind of thing, like what, what comes to mind for you? Truth to power. Truth to power. Yeah, great. The, the, the repeated failure of the leaders to, to live up to the God's, God's um, will, I, I suppose. Yep, yeah, yeah, for sure. Major theme, definitely. All right, so uh, what we'll do then is uh, I want us to be able to think through some of the key themes in the major prophets. Uh, the major prophets being Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel. And sometimes it includes Daniel, uh, but not for us tonight. Daniel sort of a, Daniel's quite unique, sort of sits in his own category in the Old Testament, really. And so he will be part of a, uh, that, well, that book, I should say, will be part of a different week um, in, I think, I'm not sure if it's next week or the week after Elizabeth. Uh, maybe you've already done it, but uh, a little bit next week. Yeah, <clears throat> right. Yeah, so so Daniel will get uh, his own his own time. Um, but I want us to think about this question for now. We're going to think about the prophetic call. Uh, that is how a prophet becomes a prophet. So we're going to break up into a couple of groups. Um, John, how many groups have we got set up at the moment? Is it one or uh, is it two oh, or three? It's three. Elizabeth, Elizabeth's doing that. Yeah. Okay, great. I've, I've got three set up. Is that all right? Yeah, yeah, that's great. Yes. So what we'll do is groups one and group three, you won't know which group you're in until you're in it. So, um, but if you're in group one or three, I want you to compare Exodus three verses one to 12 with uh, Jeremiah one. And I want you to ask the question, what elements do the respective calls of each prophet have in common? So the, the stories you're looking at are about the call of Moses as uh, into his ministry, I guess you'd call it, uh, and the call of Jeremiah into being a prophet. And I want you to look at look for some similarities. Group, group two, you're going to do the same thing, but instead of looking at Jeremiah 1, you're going to look at Isaiah 6, verses 1 to 13. So this morning, I probably didn't give the group quite enough time to read the passage and discuss it. So we'll, we'll do this for about 10 minutes. Uh, so is that clear? You, you, the, the question is going to be gone when you go into your group, I think. Um, so just, so group elements. one, it's the common, common elements. Yeah. Just try to look for similarities between what's happening in the Moses call story and yeah. either okay. Isaiah or Jeremiah's okay. story looking at. <clears throat> okay. Um, so write, just, just write down the passages group one and group three doing jeremiah group two doing isaiah uh all right we'll send you off and see you in 10 minutes everyone good okay so let's start with group three just because i started with group one this morning uh uh group group three how did you go with uh jeremiah one what what similarities did you find Tiny bit. Well, both both calls are very similar. Yes. Oh, it, indeed. And and what and what similarities did you find? Not me. Pick someone else. <laughs> well, <laughs> they were both reluctant. Both right. Of, yeah. They were both, both very reluctant. reluctant. Yes. They didn't think they were up to the job. Yep. And, and God was. God was obvious, had obviously chosen them. Yeah. And has to say, don't be afraid, I'll be with you. Yeah. I think that's a common theme. Yeah. 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 And I'll stick with you. Yeah. Yes. Um, we also said that um, 
they were kind of unlikely suspects. It, God didn't choose the people who, um, who, you, who, you, th- who you suspect, the people you think he would choose. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And in both situations, there was a need, a real need for a prophet. Oh, yeah. And, right. and God yes. mm. chose someone uh, and who he, God thought would do the job. Right, right. Um, group two, uh, Isaiah 6. What, what, did you find similar kind of uh, similar similarities or uh, anything different? Yeah, it's different, but it's also similar. He said, you know, you, I'll, I'll, I'll um, a different quite of words, but he says, you know, I'll stand with you hmm. when you speak. Um, and yeah, your sin is wiped out and I'll stand with you. And then, yep. but you know, Zion one has a thing saying, you know, but how long, Lord, how long? Yeah. And, the, and a, a, as a sense of um, a little more of the drama of being a prophet is revealed in Isaiah, I think, than in Jeremiah. Hmm. Sure, sure. Well, certainly the scene is more dramatic, isn't it? I mean, you know, you're, you, Isaiah has this kind of vision or perhaps even kind of like a transcendental trans transport uh, transportation into heaven you know, who knows what happened right but the, he has this weird experience where he's in the heavenly throne room mm. and he has this experience with god and there's an angel <laughs> and it burns his lips with a hot coal like it's a really strange story um so yeah mm. yeah look um th- yeah thanks yeah. everyone um here's some <laughs> of the stuff from moses's call that i just wanted to draw out so okay. there's a d- divine confrontation um, where uh, God oh. shows up. I mean, in the Moses story, the bush catches fire, and uh, but it's not consumed. God shows up in in the bush, right? Um, and then there's an introductory word. God says, "You know, I'm I'm good. hi, I'm God, and uh, <laughs> you know, take uh, your shoes off. Mm. Exactly, you know, take your shoes off. Uh, mm. you're oh, on the ground, yeah. and I've heard the cry of." Um, you know, my, my, my people and blah, blah, blah. Can you find somebody else? <laughs> and then there's, a, well, then there's a commission. I'm sending you to do so-and-so. And then Moses goes, mm, no, not me. I, don't, I don't speak good and um, stuff. <laughs> and God, <laughs> God reassures him. Oh, and then there's a kind of confirming sign from God with the, the staff and the snake and and all that <clears throat> excuse me and you see a similar kind of pattern in both isaiah and jeremiah so they might not map on each other 100 percent. they might get the things out of order but the all these elements do exist in some way in all three of those stories and um you know to a certain extent you could look at it with ezekiel even though ezekiel's call is much more complex just because of how strange that book is <clears throat> so i didn't use it for this activity but um, the, there is a call that these people aren't, they don't just wake up one day and decide they're going to be prophets. In fact, I, I suspect Jeremiah probably would have had a better life if he had to, be, you know, yeah. had, if he, well, at least by a certain standard, he would have had a better life if he hadn't have um, been a, a prophet. So <clears throat> it's not that they think it's a good idea. It's that they have a, a profound call from God to be a prophet. Now, that's important. And we'll come back to that at the end when we... Uh, do you, Matthew, as you said earlier, one of the real things is that both of them said, look, not me. Yeah. I'm too young. Well, that's a Jeremiah's claim. And, <clears throat> yes. Yeah, send someone else. And Moses was the same. Yeah. Well, that's, yeah, that's the objection from the prophet. Yeah. In that list there. Um, so, all right. Now, well, I'll be clear... Before we on, finish that... Before you yeah, finish yeah. that, I thought there's quite a big difference between the calls to uh, Moses and to Jeremiah. Yeah, yeah. Moses was being called to be a leader. Yes. Whereas Jeremiah and I presume Isaiah were being called to sort out it, the people who had been uh, pulled yeah. away from God. No, that, that, mm-hmm. that, that reminds call. me of something, something I should have said. So the reason I look back to Moses... Uh, And look, as you've been finding in this unit, there's all sorts of complications around what date different books were written and what stories came before other stories chronologically, uh, as opposed to how they appear in the Bible. 
Um, so there's all sorts of complexities about that, right? But just putting that aside for a sec, just in terms of the story that the Bible tells in the order that it, it, it you know, it has them, there's this sense that uh, the prophets look back to Moses for how their vocation will look. What does it mean for them to be a prophet? Well, they basically fulfill the role of Moses, in a sense, in being the people who enforce the covenant they're always looking back to the covenant that Moses established, or, you know, Moses is part of establishing between God and the people of Israel. And so Moses is kind of like the paradigm. He's like the, the, um, the blueprint for how you are a prophet. So yeah, John, definitely there are differences. I'm not suggesting that the, um, these call narratives are all identical, but uh, they all have significant similarities about, how the prophet is called and i think that's got to do with the fact that moses is kind of like the prototype for, yeah, but, the, for, for but, a prophet but matthew isn't it true that moses the story of moses was written after isaiah yep so it's it's quite likely that it's written after no doubt well sorry i don't it, possibly I, I don't say no doubt i actually don't know. but um i mean <laughs> it's 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 quite hard to tell uh, and, you know, which version? Are we talking about the version as we have it, an earlier version? You know, these are big questions that we can't answer. Uh, in yeah, this. So, so the written account that we have of Moses, we believe was written after the time of Isaiah. But yes. the stories about Moses presumably date back quite, oh, yeah. quite far beyond that. So we don't quite know what the, the, or, the shape of the oral tradition about Moses right. is, but we've got a later written version. That, that's what makes the complexity, I think. Yeah, yeah. The, the, that's exactly the point that I was going to make. You, yeah, oh, but but we're, the, we're talking about an oral culture. We're not yeah, talking yeah. about... Uh, I mean, most people couldn't read. But the written verge is probably to tidy up the story. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, and, you know, there's all sorts of um, possibilities about why the Moses story exists, which you've already looked at um, in your... Uh, in in the unit so far, so I won't get into that in in any meaningful way. Uh, but it is worth saying we don't actually know how these traditions really started. We don't really know where Moses' tradition comes from. We don't really know if there's a real Moses, uh, and if there is, we don't really know what he did. Um, but we have a story about that person. And it's likely that it goes back quite a long way, but it only takes the form of a written story as we have it fairly late. Does that make sense? It's, so, a, it's, a, it's a fairly detailed story. Yeah, yeah. And it's likely that what we have is actually a bunch of stories that we'll put together later. Yes. But anyway, we're getting off the off track of... Oh, the of the so uh, is everybody clear about why we call... Uh, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel, the major prophets, and why we call the other 12 <laughs> minor prophets. Big, big books. Big books, little books. Yeah, pretty much. It's got nothing to do with how important they are, although Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel are probably a, the most important prophets. Um, <clears throat> but uh, that's probably got to do with the length of the books and, and the effect of having so much material as opposed to them just inherently being more important. So major is not about going, these are the great, these are the good ones and the other ones are not so good. It's just about the fact that their books are really long. Uh, so the 12, the 12, what we call the minor prophets, typically in tradition, their, their books would be written on a single scroll altogether and they would all fit. So you know, that's, that's where the names come from. Now, as I've got there on the slide, I'll just read what I've got. The primary function of prophets was to speak for God to the people of their time. Now, there's a bunch of stuff there that we could dig into. Um, that what does it mean to speak for God? Um, stuff like that. But the one I want to draw out is that they're speaking to the people of their time. In certain traditions uh, in the church or certain... Um, uh, tribes in the church prophecy including the stuff that's found in the bible is all about the future so the book of revelation is the obvious example here it's obviously not in the old testament but you see people who uh, think about revelation as something that is entirely unfulfilled something that will happen even in our future and that's how they think about those texts whereas 
the the violence against the text that I think that kind of approach does is that it fails to, to take into account what the text might have meant to the original audience to whom it was written. And we need to remember that these texts are written to a particular people and they are written at a particular time. And um, so the books or oracles were not uh, for us in particular. Doesn't mean we don't read them and ask what God might be saying through them. It's just that in their original form, they're obviously written for people who are not us, for people of their own time. And so we need to be, uh, we need to just make sure that that is at least part, that, that is our starting point for how we read these texts. I know that is in some ways fairly obvious, um, but it's not always so. Okay, let's uh, change what we're talking about a bit. Let's talk about the function of prophecy. Well, what does a prophet do? What does it mean to be a prophet? Uh, what function are you fulfilling by being one? Well, there's a bunch of stuff we could say, and it's all very like most things you've been learning about quite complex uh, but generally speaking the prophet's message can be seen in a threefold function that they fulfilled among the people of god they were preachers they were predictors and they were watchmen or watch people and so as preachers they preached and interpreted the law of moses that was at the heart of what they did so this is why they're sometimes called covenant enforcers or in the video we watched at the beginning covenant lawyers they are really uh, their, their their ministry as prophets is essentially geared towards enforcing the covenant that um, had been established between uh, the people and god through moses so they keep going back to that that's at the heart of what they do they are also predictors sometimes so this is the this is what we need to be careful about as the video that we watched at the beginning uh, said and i think it said it quite helpfully when we think of prophets in our in even in our culture which we don't really do kind of prophecy but even when we do use the language of prophet uh, particularly in our secular culture what we tend to mean is someone who predicts the future and so you know if you uh, talk about people in the 1970s who were talking about global warming. Nowadays, it might be common to say, oh, well, they, they were prophets. Now, what people don't mean is that they were hearing from God and proclaiming God's word to the people of Australia or the world or whatever. We just mean that they predict the future. Now, they, they didn't really. They just read the signs and, and did their research. But nonetheless, that's what we generally mean but in the bible that is not primarily what a prophet does in fact when you read the prophets most of what they write is not prediction it's a statement about the present and when they do predict the future it is with a view to informing uh, and changing behavior in the present that's what they do so when they say you know, Babylon is going to come and it's going to wipe out Jerusalem, blah, blah, blah. That's not just a prediction for the sake of it. So they can say, how accurate was I? They're predicting the future in order to affect people's attitudes and behaviors in the present. They want people to change the way they're living so that they're more faithful to Yahweh or whatever the case may be. So that's how prediction fits in. And finally, watchmen, they watch over the people of Israel that is reasonably straightforward. Let's have a, a bit of a, a pit stop into the three uh, major prophets we're going to look at. Dan, there's a column for Daniel there as well, but we're just going to ignore him for today. Um, just very briefly, look at who did these three prophesy to? Well, they all prophesied to uh, Jews or Israelites or whatever you, it's, uh, whatever you want to call them in that period of history. Um, Isaiah was uh, in Judah, but actually also in exile. And Jeremiah is in Judah and in exile. And Ezekiel is uh, prophesying to the Jews who are in exile in Babylon. So there's a bunch before exile, a bunch during exile. And in the case of Isaiah, a bunch after exile as well. But we'll get to that in a sec, a bit later. 
And they generally concern the behavior of Judah or the house of Israel, whatever name you want to give to it at the time. Um, they, if you have a look in Isaiah and Jeremiah, both prophesy over the reign of quite a few kings. Now, it probably looks more impressive than it is. It's worth just remembering that they didn't all necessarily live that long, <laughs> uh, especially for Je in Jeremiah's case, those last few kings had very short reigns overall. Um, Ezekiel, he uh, prophesied during the reign of Zedekiah, who was the last king of Israel and uh, who was king as, as they were going and, and when they were in Babylon. And then he's also proclaiming during the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, who was the king of Babylon, uh, who you see written about in the book of Daniel. So that's, that's kind of just an overview of, kind of you know, the, the period they're in and what they're doing. Okay. Now, this is a map of the path that the exiles took from Jerusalem to Babylon. Pretty long. You can see that they sort of skirt around following the river system. Why might that be? Well, because that's the safest way to go. You don't want to just cross over the desert. It's probably not the, be the best way to, um, to, to travel to Babylon, not entirely safe. But they've walked a long way. So here's, here's my question, though. What, what do you already know about the exile in Babylon? And why do you think knowing about the exile might be important to understanding the prophets? at least the prophets we're looking at today. To try and help people understand what was going on. What was the story? Right, exactly. So yeah. there's a story behind the prophets. They're not just prophesying into thin air, um, in, into some vacuum, but there's actually so, there's, there's things going on around them. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, and to put, put the big picture uh, around it, and of course... You know, that's that's the story. And, of course, the other people were trying to write down their history so they know where they've been. Yeah. Because they were no longer in the safe territory of being in Judah. Or, yeah. Yep. It really so makes, makes a lot of difference to me when we understand that we that Babylonian period was terribly important in both for the prophets, but also for those who wrote down the law and the covenant because they were trying to say this is who we are. Yes. And they were trying to say, and this is what's happening to us. Yep. Does that make sense or not? Does to me. Does to me. <laughs> uh, is there anything that we, any uh, important things we know about the exile off the top of your head? The Babylonians worshipped other gods other than Israel. Yep. Than the Jews. Yeah, that's right. So the chief god for the Babylonians was a god named Marduk, and Marduk um, had the was at least as far as the, the the Babylonian creation story went, Marduk had become the chief god through essentially murdering his uh, parents, ripping his mother in half, <laughs> uh, and using her blood and guts to create the world and. Um, he, he killed some other gods later and used their guts and stuff to create humanity. So that's the kind of god that they worship. Yes. Did they have the Did they have the assurance that they were only going to be there for seventy years? Uh, yeah. So so Jeremiah's claim was that they would be there for seventy years. Um, they weren't there for exactly seventy years, but it's pretty close to that. Um, so that's about the length that they. Well, well, actually, sorry, I, what I should say is that was the length of time that people were there before they were allowed to return uh, to, uh, you know, Jerusalem and, and Judah and, and the land of Israel um, by King Cyrus of Persia. So the reason I state, state it like that is that uh, not everybody returned. And in fact, at a historical level, so this isn't, you, you wouldn't know this from reading the Bible, actually, but historically speaking, the majority of people um, stay, stayed in Babylon. Yeah. And that, that Babylonian dispersion uh, is a major event. In fact, uh, Babylon is kind of like the capital of uh, 
Jewish, the Jewish people and Jewish, you know, faith and all that kind of stuff, uh, Jewishness, let's say, it's, it's the world capital of Jewry uh, for a long time after this, actually. Probably it's not until the Middle Ages that it really become, it moves on from here to, to uh, elsewhere. So, and, and it's not until the 20th century, really, that the capital of world Jewry becomes Israel uh, again, or, you know, the land of Israel, Palestine, whatever you'd like to call it. Uh, so, yeah, it, sometimes the way the Bible talks about this stuff can skew uh, our perception of what actually happened historically. And that's fine. They're telling a story and they're trying to make a point. Um, but Babylon becomes a major place for Jews uh, from this period on. Well, they were, they were told to settle down and have families, weren't they? Yeah, that's right. Uh, Jeremiah in Jeremiah uh, 29 talks about, um, uh, well, there's a whole bunch of stuff he talks about, but, he, but the most famous passage, I think, from the, that part of his book is about uh, seeking the, the peace or seeking the shalom of the city uh, mm. because in its shalom you will find your shalom um, and you might know that passage it might it, your translation might say uh, seek the welfare of the city or seek the peace of the city but the, the word there is shalom it's it's sort of um, seek the you know seek the wholeness of the city really is what it's saying um, so there is an encouragement there in the prophets, yes, to make uh, the most out of the time in Babylon. And then that leads the way to 31, where he says, I'll write it in your heart so that the, the temple story is not as important to the covenant at all. Yep. Uh, yeah, yeah. That, that's, uh, th there is an internal critique in the prophets about the temple system. That's right. Yep. Um, there are conflicting attitudes about the temple and all that kind of stuff. Um, and Jeremiah certainly has this notion that up to that point, the way that uh, law functioned might not be something that can truly see um, the obedience of the people, and there might need to be more internal uh, works of the heart uh, being done to, to see that happen. But there's different ways you can read that. I won't sort of pronounce how it ought to be read. Um, yeah. Thank and of you. course, you know, with all these things, you've got to be very careful in the way you read them. You don't want to lapse into supersessionism, that kind of thing. Uh, Peter, you're on mute, mate. So it's, is it true that a lot of the Old Testament was written in Babylon then? Um, a, a, a decent amount of it would have been probably, yeah. Uh, I mean, I think nowadays, and Elizabeth and John, you know, you correct me if this isn't entirely correct, um, but from what I can tell, um, the creation stories, or at least the first one, yes, probably know. found their uh, something like their current form in Babylon. Um, again, we, we just don't know when the final form came about, how it came about, but... I, I would suggest that the creation story that we have in Genesis is largely influenced by creation stories like that of the Babylonians. Yeah. And it, um, Peter, if you look on back back on page 21 of the um, resource book, that yeah. chart, um, which was trying to set out a chronology of what was written when, you go about a third of the page, third way down the page, and you start to find some of Ezekiel, Lamentations, Joshua, Judges, etc., written during the exile. Um, maybe some started in the exile and completed at a later date. Mm. Uh, so that yeah. whole middle third of that chart is about books that were written or started in the exile. And then the bottom third is about books that were written after the exile, the return from exile, which is where we're yeah. okay. So that that shows you that um, the, I th I think actually the the majority and maybe even a significant majority of the Old Testament in the form that we now have it comes from the exile, i.e., in Babylon, mm. and then afterwards. And, and I heard some, you can say once, why this. I'll go, Peter. Go. Oh, I heard somebody say once: if you want to know what what it is to be an Australian, you have to leave Australia. <laughs> and um, 
<laughs> it's like I think maybe the exile was what sorted out their identity. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, that's a really good point, Peter. I was just about to say something like that. You were, well, what I was going to say was is that you can imagine why there would be an explosion of writing around mm. this time because the, the the Jewish elites have just been marched from Jerusalem, which they thought was the greatest city in the world. They've gone on this long journey and ended up in Babylon. And Babylon, Babylon would be like, what, what would it be like? Um, it would be, uh, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to find something that wouldn't be offensive to someone. Um, uh, um, look, let's just say it would be like going from a city that you thought was amazing to then going to a city that just blew it out of the water, make it made it look like a little hick town, and you okay. realise actually, <laughs> you know, where I am isn't that great. It's kind of like marching from some little um, town in in the back of Texas in the United States, and then going to New York and going <laughs> maybe my little town in Texas ain't that good. Right. Mm. Like arriving in Canada. Yeah. Mm. Newcastle to Paris. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Something like that, right? Um, and so the thing that the thing that interests me is that both in Judges and in Joshua, we, we have written written accounts. We have the book of Joshua and the book of somewhere else. So, so there was there was writing way back then. Uh well, we don't. Well, we just don't know what was written. It's very no, possible we, 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 that no, these were stories to, that were told. To, to, to dismiss orally. to dismiss everything as something made up in Babylon is a little bit tricky, isn't it? I don't think that it's made up. I think no. oral culture is extremely strong yeah. in cultures that are like in non-Western cultures. We need to remember that. So, I mean, Aboriginal culture in Australia is like this, right? Like the stories that they tell are remarkably consistent uh, across, you know, different parts of the country. And yet these are stories that have gone back millennia, many, many millennia, right? Um, I don't think being an oral culture means um, being a culture that doesn't care about the consistency of a story or right. doesn't care about the meaning of a story or, you know, it doesn't mean any of that. I, it, being an oral culture, you can have fairly accurate uh, or, you know, you can have fairly consistent uh, and accurate stories and we just need to i think keep that in mind these are people who most people couldn't write so all they were able to do was to tell stories orally and i'm i'm imagining that their memories would have been insanely good yeah uh so they know, use them. that's right they exercise them i exercise my fingers and mr google uh it's not quite the same thing you know so um, Sorry, I have a question. Um, why didn't God just, in terms of the, the function of prophets and the role of prophets, why didn't God just communicate to people directly? Why does he need someone to like intercede? And my second question was, um, why is like Samuel not considered um, like a prophet? Uh, so, or Samuel is. The book of Samuel, though, in, just in the style of the book, it's written as a history kind of book. Okay. So that's it's it's not a it's not a statement about Samuel as as a person as whether he was a prophet or not. I think the he would Samuel is certainly seen as a prophet. It's just that his book is written in a different style to some of these later prophetic books. Okay. Um, as to the first question, um, you're going to have to take that one up with the with um, with the proverbial man upstairs, Greg. I. I... <laughs> <laughs> I know. I, I mean, I, I'm, that's not a, that's not me saying that I can't take the question seriously, but I genuinely don't know. It's um, a good day for doing that, Matt, because it's the Ascension Day. So if we could just go up and ask, then you know, we... <laughs> that would be helpful. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't know. Um, yeah, I mean, look, it may be what the one reason I can think of is that most people are probably not in a position where they are able or willing to actually hear what God has to say, uh, at least not directly. And sure, God can speak to those people, but, um, you know, 
I think our experience tells us that God, um, God doesn't just brazenly wave uh, God's word around, um, but actually it is spoken in this, uh, specific moments um, where it, it, it has power, uh, you know, and et cetera. These were people who, for whatever reason, were in a position where they could hear God and God was going to use that to speak to others who maybe were not willing to hear. For what it, you know, for all sorts of reasons. That's probably the best that I can do, I think. I don't know that yeah. I have a answer for that. Matthew, well, what does Jeremiah say when it's talking about writing it in your heart? I mean, that's just a direct um, statement towards there's a relationship there. And it's a way to get around the priesthood. Um, yeah, I, I mean, that's, one, <laughs> that's certainly one way to read it. Um, it's important. I, look, I look. I grew. I grew up obviously in our culture here, you know, and 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 white uh, culture here in Australia. So I have a pretty cynical view of things like uh, priesthoods, just by virtue of how I've grown up. So you know, I can't not bring that cultural baggage to bear on the way that I read texts like that. Yeah. Mm. Um, Certainly, Christian tradition has kind of, uh, you know, in, in, interpreted that passage from Jeremiah ultimately to say that what has been done in Christ mm. is to write the law on our hearts such yes, that, man. you know, and, and for most, they would say such that we don't actually need the letter of the law. Uh, it's been abolished or, you know, whatever language gets used. Um, but it's been written onto our heart that we have the Holy Spirit and so on and so forth. And so I think that's, you know, that's fine. Um, I'm sort of concerned about sometimes the way that that causes us to read the Old Testament or to think about, um, you know, how God relates to Jewish people nowadays. So there's, I just want to be, you know, have some caution around that. Mm. Um, but I think that generally that yeah. is, is okay. And it's pretty standard in Christian history. Um so yeah but then again you know we we tended to reinterpret jesus as prophet uh king and priest you know it's it's not that we mm. dissolve the idea of priesthood entirely it's that we find it fulfilled in some way in in christ but anyway that's probably getting away from prophets a little bit what's um, interesting that every pro every 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 king has a prophet yeah, well, and, and that goes into the fact that um, there are different types of prophets. You have court prophets. Um, I mean, the, Isaiah, the historical person, was probably a court prophet. Hmm. He, pro he prophesied in the court of people, of kings like Hezekiah. Uh, but then you have prophets who are definitely not that. Jeremiah is not a court prophet. He's not uh, accepted in the court of the king uh, to, you know, hear what God has to say through him. I am not no, but you, but you had earlier you had Elijah and Elisha who, who were unwelcome prophets most of the time. Yes, yeah, well, that's right. There's others who are certainly not court prophets. I mean, Amos. Um, there's a little bit of debate around what exactly he means by this, but it seems pretty clear that he says, "My father's not a prophet." You know, I'm. This is not a a, a family trade. You know, um, I've, been, or something. I've been called by God to do this. So, uh, all right, let's just move on. Otherwise, we won't get through everything. Um, look, the basic form of uh, the prophet's message comes in the Deuteronomistic form of blessings and curses. Now, when I say Deuteronomistic, what I mean is that it's a it's the theology of Deuteronomy, particularly the last uh, four or five chapter uh, five chapters that is. Um, where Deuteronomy basically sets out to say, all right, you've got the covenant now. Live this way and you'll have life. Live this way and there'll be death. Live this way and there'll be blessing. Live this way and there'll be curse. And so that's what's called Deuteron Deuteronomistic uh, theology, where basically do the right thing and it'll go well, uh, do the wrong thing and it'll go bad. Now, that is a theology that is, I, I think we'd all probably say, eh, it's a bit more complicated than that. And the Old Testament certainly does. There are books like the book of Job, which challenge that theology and say, it's not that simple, 
right? Mm. But the, but it's the basic pattern of the prophets, no less. However, we want to think about it, whether it's like kind of a generalization or um, you know a basic pattern of life that mostly holds true. Whatever the case, this is the pattern of prophecy. So you've broken the covenant. Repent. That is in Hebrew shuv, uh, which means turn around, turn back to God. Um, and if you don't repent, there'll be judgment and punishment, but there will be hope um, beyond that judgment for a glorious future restoration. That's the basic template of the prophets for the most part, certainly the major prophets. That's kind of how they, how they work. Now, we had a long discussion this morning. I've got the question there in the bottom left of the slide about what is judgment? Like, how, what do we actually mean by that? Because that's no small topic in and of itself. Now we don't have time because we've just we're running a little bit over. Um, but I guess what I'd want to suggest is that when we talk about judgment, I think what we're talking about is not necessarily the active um, role of God in uh, punishing every sin and that kind of thing. It's more about the fact that God has set up a kind of uh, a universe with, with a moral program to it. And when we live in a certain way, we reap certain consequences. And that can, is, that can be, well, that is what judgment is, that the world has been set up in a certain way to reap certain consequences for actions. Now, there's all sorts of complexities around that. We can ask, but well, what about this story where God seems to actively punish sin? What about this story where, you know, Yes, that's all true. And we can, you know, we, we need to think about how we understand those stories, whether we understand that God was literally wiping out people groups or, or uh, helping the people of Israel to wipe out people groups because sin had been committed, or whether there's something else going on in those stories beyond the sort of beyond the surface level. Those are big questions. And I don't want to um, just try to skip over them. But we just don't have time because they are. <laughs> isn't this isn't this the isn't this the gospel? Uh, and what do you mean by that? Sorry, Derek. Well, the, the, you've broken the covenant. You've sinned. No repentance and judgment from him. There is hope beyond because Christ died for you. I mean, it's 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 almost the you know uh, a foretaste of of what of what we we preach today. Yeah, yeah, I, I think there's probably something to that. I I would just point out that it doesn't necessarily define what judgment actually is. Um, it, it it doesn't help us to better define that. It just states the reality that we do face uh, judgment in some sense in history, uh, in our in our lives maybe, but more importantly, and certainly as the Bible tells it, um, that it happens in history, and judgment is somewhat indiscriminate in some senses, right? So this is the thing we need to take moral stock of is the fact that, you know, uh, the Babylonians come and they smash Judah. Well, who suffers most because of that? Um, well, probably like peasants and, <laughs> you know, poor people, those who, they, they weren't the leaders of Israel. They weren't leading the people astray. They weren't the ones causing others to sin, right? So, yeah we it's a big complex conversation and i i don't really know how to put it better than that uh at least in this time frame so uh all right let's speaking of sin let's talk about the main sins of the people that the major prophets point out and there's three big ones that that happen one is idolatry two social injustice and three religious ritual now, there's a bunch of questions at the bottom there. We won't go into those now because um, I've got some stuff I want to do uh, at the end. But those are the big ones. Now, uh, religious ritual uh, uh, seems a bit strange to us because we, we sort of think, why, why should there be uh, negative consequences, judgment or whatever we want to call it against uh, doing religious ritual badly? Um, well, we've got to keep in mind that really what's going on, there's some stuff there on the slide. I'm not, I didn't write that. And I'm not entirely sure I'm happy with the way it's been communicated. Um, uh, it, I think what, what's really going on is that the people have, or at least the leaders of Israel, I should say, have 
uh, committed themselves to certain religious ritual, which is, is deeply important, by the way. Ritual is, it does help to shape us, but they've done that at the expense of what they're trying to shape. That is the life of the nation geared towards being faithful to God. And so the ritual becomes an empty thing where it's not actually about trying to form people and, and a nation that will live according to God's character and the will of God. So you can see why that would be a big problem. <laughs> Uh, and, and what does that lead to? Well, it leads to social injustice. It leads to the poor being crushed under the weight of effects created by the wealthy and the powerful. Mm. Because the, the law was extremely clear that the poor of Israel were meant to be cared for, that there was meant to be economic uh, redistribution, that slaves uh, were meant to be treated well, uh, animals were meant to be treated well, the land was meant to be treated well. And all this kind of, uh, excuse me a sec, <coughs> excuse me, all these kinds of things were uh, meant to be concerns for the people of Israel, but they weren't always throughout their history. And so the prophets point out these social injustices. And then idolatry is kind of the big one, really. And what that, what idolatry is really about is the fact that to worship God is also to be conformed into the image of God. You become like the thing that you worship. You become uh, conformed to the image of the thing uh, to which you give your life. And so if you give your life to Marduk, the God of ba the chief God of Babylon, and you worship Marduk, you will become more like Marduk because that is the, you know, what Marduk does becomes the set of values that are most important to you and so if a, a, a nation that wor worships Marduk will become a violent uh, bloodthirsty nation and to worship Yahweh though is to become like Yahweh uh, and when Israel turns away from God they live in a way that is contrary to the will of God. Now that's putting it fairly simply. There's all sorts of things we could say in addition to that, but that's basically the shape of what the prophets think. Any questions about any of that? No? Okay. And now uh, just, uh, yeah, let's talk about just briefly some of the forms of prophecy that you get with um, these prophets. So you get the lawsuit, which is, relates to what we've already talked about that the prophets are covenant enforcers and so they're pointing back to the law and saying you failed to live according to this so hence lawsuit that's that's a major form of prophetic uh, speech in the major prophets you've also got woes now woes are um it's debated what a woe actually is um we tend, we probably naturally think about them as, uh, how would you say it? Um, Doom and gloom. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. That uh, woe is Israel because you've done this. This is what's going to happen. You know, that's that's how we tend to think about it. There is some um, suggestion that maybe it doesn't mean that. That maybe what a woe really is is about. Uh, Shame is about saying shame on you for this way you've acted. Here are going to be the consequences of this, but it's about trying to convince people to turn away from those actions, to turn towards more uh, honourable actions, if you will. So whatever the case may be, though, woe, woe speech, woe oracles are common in the major prophets. You've got the promise or the salvation oracle. Um, you know, you can imagine what that's, what that's about. Uh, it's a it's a prophecy in which there's a promise there's um, the god will sort everything out eventually and you see this especially in um isaiah um he he has uh or isaiah has uh lots of fairly significant forms of this um but you do see it in jeremiah we've already talked about the you know putting uh, you know the law in the heart uh, in Jeremiah 31, uh, so that's a you know that's a that's a promise that's a salvation oracle. Um, 
in Ezekiel. Ezekiel's a weird, weird book. I mean, I don't know if you've read it, but um, it's such a strange book. His image, it, like it, um, it probably pairs well with a nice cheese and some magic mushrooms. You know, like it, <laughs> it's that kind of book. Uh, and uh, not that I'm not that I'm saying you should do that, by the way, but. Um, <laughs> I'm not recommending it. I'm just saying that's probably, I, I mean, Ezekiel, you know, who knows what he was like, but, but whatever experiences he had of God were clearly, you know, strange ones. And um, his salvation oracles are like the Valley of the dry bones, right? It, mm -hmm. That's a strange story, but that is a salvation mm -hmm. oracle. It's a, it's a promise oracle. So um and then you've got it, it, before we go off page 107 in in our books there yeah in, in the in the, the passage that says table group read and discuss this categories of lewd life what's lewd mean i couldn't find it in my dictionary lewd life i haven't got the book in front of me i confess so how, how do you spell that l-u-d-e lewd life I, I actually, I'd have to get back to you about that. I'm not sure what the book means. It might, I, it's not a typo. I don't know. I've never heard it. It might be, it might be, it might be rude life. I don't know. I'm not sure. If, if, if the, whoever wrote it was a, was a tie, it quite probably should be rude life because they, they mix the L's and the R's anyway. I, I'm, I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I would, I, I didn't pick that up when I went through this book, Derek. Um, no. uh, I would think that it's it's linked with health, prosperity, prosperity, agricultural abundance, respect, and safety. So I would think rude life. That's an old-fashioned kind of phrase, but yes, it's, uh, it's, not, it's, not in a, it's not in either of my dictionaries. That's all. No, I think it's a typo. I think it's supposed to be rude, as in as in rude health, like yes, good. Yeah, that's, good. that's okay. what I guess it might be. Well picked. So, I, I, thought, I thought it might have been a tie. Who, who wrote it? Because <laughs> they do mix their else and our else. Yeah, um, no, I don't, don't think so. <laughs> no, no, I doubt that. But um, the the next the next category is um, enactment prophecy, or what we might just call an action prophecy. This is where the prophet doesn't necessarily use words, but uses an action to communicate the word of God. And so you can think of examples like where Isaiah goes. Uh, naked for three years you can think of examples like where um, Ezekiel lays in it lays on his side for a whole period of time um, and where Ezekiel cooks food over uh, a fire that is uh, using dung to, bur to burn um, or where Jeremiah buys a field um, mm. as a prophetic act these are all sort of prophetic actions that communicate the word of God through dramatization rather than through just speech. Mm. Isaiah certainly didn't live in Jindabyne. <laughs> no, well, well, you know, he, he maybe, I, I think um, it would get pretty cold in winter in those three years at some point. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, it's just, it's just part yeah. of the drama, isn't it? So, mm -hmm. um, and then finally, the messenger speech. This is the thus says the Lord uh, type mm -hmm. thing, where they uh, claim to be speaking directly God's word rather than sort of some, you know, something around that. Uh, and then lastly, um, this isn't one of the forms. It's just to say that at the heart of the prophets is a concern for both orthodoxy, right belief and orthopraxy, right action. The wording there, I, you know, I didn't write this uh, material. It says that the prophets called the people to a balance of both. I think that's a bad way of putting it as if, because you, when you're trying to balance things, sometimes you're trying to have less of something to try to balance them. Um, mm. it's, not, it's not about that. It's about saying the, the prophets want people to e excel in both, both right belief and right action, because they support one another. Yeah. If, we believe, if we believe rightly, it does help us to have right action. If you believe something really weird about God, um, that you know makes god into a kind of angry uh, dictator for example that's going to affect how you live and if I, we I, I, I wrote james against that one yeah yeah that's right 
Um, you know, faith without deeds is dead, that kind of thing. That's right. Okay. Uh, let's quickly, before we have a bit of discussion at the end, just go through the three prophets. Um, their books are long. I mean, Isaiah is 66 chapters, so we can't go through them in any detail. <clears throat> but just to say some of their themes and some points of interest. So Isaiah, son of a guy named Amos, that was the original Isaiah. The interesting thing, though, is Isaiah um, is written over a long period of time certainly not by Isaiah all the way through. When we get to the next slide, I'll say more about that. But some of the key themes in Isaiah are salvation, exile, and the servant. So the servant is a major theme if you have read mm -hmm. Isaiah, particularly in the middle section or, you know, around chapter 42, 43, 44. Um, and there's lots of debate about who is the the servant is it a person is it a group is it all of israel uh, you know the, the suffering servant who is it um obviously in christian tradition it gets applied to jesus both in the new testament and in later tradition um the suffering servant is said to be jesus and i think that's true and we can also say that originally it wasn't intended to be jesus at least by the prophet this is how the bible works it, it doesn't work on one level it works on multiple levels so that's fine. But Isaiah, the 66 chapters grew over several centuries, and they were written by at least three different people and probably groups of people, not just individuals. And so you've got first, second, and third Isaiah there. Generally speaking, uh, it's thought that first Isaiah is written before the exile, second Isaiah during the exile, and third Isaiah after the exile. And you can see the different kind of thematic things in those different sections of Isaiah. They are distinct. Um, and it, it makes sense why uh, critical biblical scholars have tended to divide the book like this. Okay, that's probably enough about Isaiah. Quickly, one slide on Jeremiah. He's called the weeping prophet. Jeremiah is extremely depressing. Um, <laughs> if you've read the book, and especially his other book, uh, Lamentations. I mean, it's called Lamentations for a reason. So depressing. But you can understand why the nation is in the middle of a catastrophe. They go into exile. They lose um, their sense of who they are and, and so on and so forth. So um, Jeremiah is kind of a weeping prophet, a suffering prophet. Uh, he has a fairly hard life. Mm. Um, two of the prominent themes in Jeremiah, he warns of God's judgment, but there's also a message of hope and restoration. Um, as we've already talked about, you know, writing the law on the hearts of people and that kind of thing. That's probably all we can say about Jeremiah right now. And then Ezekiel, as I've said, a weird book, really tripped out imagery. It's just great. I, it's such a good book. Um, uh, some of the themes are the fall of Jerusalem, the coming new temple. So this kind of eschatological temple or end time temple that he envisages. Uh, restoration and the spirit the spirit becomes a major theme in Ezekiel whereas before it wasn't necessarily so uh, it, you, you see a big jump in kind of the development of the idea of the spirit of God it, it, it's obviously not developed to the point of what we know in Christian tradition um, the Holy Spirit and that kind of thing but um, but you get a big sort of kickstart to this theme and and one of them one of the notable features of of ezekiel is his three images of glory or three uh, visions i should say of glory and they're in chapter one chapter eight to eleven and chapter 40 to uh, 48 uh you know if you want something that's interesting to read give those a read they're just fantastic and you know crazy just just crazy mm. love it anyway okay we're right at the end. I'm going to send you off uh, for five minutes into your breakout rooms. And I want you to discuss these four questions briefly. You don't have to give long answers, just um, basically what you think. What was the core message of the major prophets? What do they teach us about God? What hope do they provide Israel? And finally, and, and this one's a, qu a question for us specifically, rather than something that arises out of the text or the texts what does it mean to be prophetic 
in our time. What does that actually mean in light of what we've been learning this evening? All right, we're at the tail end for sure. Um, so tell me, what is the core message of the major prophets? If somebody asked you, what would you say? Is there a right way to live and a wrong way to live? Right. Yeah, yeah. Which is? What would they, what would they say, do you think? Being Stay in. Keep, keep, keep your relationship with God. Keep, yeah. keep in relationship with God and the rest of creation. Yeah. Yep. And there are so many of the prophet themes that we've that I think are threads that we weave together that are, are the fundamental understanding of God's and it's the nature of that keeping in relationship, as Peter says. Uh, the prophets can help us understand what that might mean yep. in the way we live. Yeah. And, and often it's meaning that you'll probably be, you know, you need to challenge the status quo. That prophets all did, um, you know, and that's something I think that I find with from them is the courage to challenge the system in terms of the, the, the um, relationship with God that they call us out, whether it's Amos or Micah or whoever. Yep, yep. I saw you on TV, John, talking about the management of the rivers yeah, in New South know, Wales. Yeah. That, that was prophetic. That was prophetic. Yeah. <laughs> well, it got me into a bit of trouble. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, it wasn't easy to be a prophet, was it? <laughs> I don't know about that. I don't take humor. But I do, I do find the prophets, so many of the, the, the themes that Jesus picks up, they set the framing for it in so many ways, I think. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Um, because there are in the all throughout the Old Testament, there are different ways, kind of different lenses to understand God and Israel and all this kind of stuff. And one of them is a prophetic lens. And I think there, an argument can be made, and and a strong argument can be made that that's what Jesus ultimately does. Picks yeah. up a kind of prophetic lens with some amendments. With some, he does, you know, he does shift some things oh, yeah. around, but. Um, but yeah, okay. So what what do the prophets teach us about God? His faithfulness, right? Be faithful. Each each of them gave us a little thread of what they experienced of God, and 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 so that's what I see. It's a, a whole lot of threads and, and and insights and glimpses that we get from the prophets. Yeah. Yeah. Others, maybe there's a few people who haven't said much. Uh, I'll give you an opportunity. Sorry. Um, <laughs> when we get asked a question about what it says about God, I think the, the assumption is always to say something good. <laughs> but yep. sometimes I actually quite, uh, reading things, I actually quite struggle and think, well, I don't actually necessarily see that in a good light yeah, um, yeah, one of the yeah. thing one of the things about the prophets is like god is actually saying you need to do this or bad bad's gonna happen it's like i mean it, there's, there's this idea of this this jealousy this idea of you know i'm in charge you need to like i guess people don't have much choice it's either my way or the highway um, I mean, arguably, <laughs> arguably, he's doing that, you know, to maybe create a balance and whatever. But part of me, sometimes I always kind of wrestle with the idea of um, just, just the way it strikes me and not necessarily wanting to be, you know, God is awesome, which he is clearly. But, you know, it's like, hang on, like, yeah, it's kind of like, it just seems a bit, sometimes it just seems very harsh. That's all. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I look. I don't think naming that is a problem. No. Um, I, I don't no. think. I don't think. Um, <laughs> I don't think God has any trouble with us. Maybe you know, saying that well, the biblical accounts of God are often problematic, <laughs> yeah. at, at, a, at a, especially at a surface level. Yeah. Uh, so, I, I think that's all right. Um, and certainly, the prophets do make God out to be that uh, harsh in, in a lot of ways. In a way. And in a way that we don't necessarily see in Jesus. Mm. And this brings us back to that question of hermeneutics that we looked at when I was here a month ago. How do we read these texts? Like, well, ultimately, what, what are we doing with them? And I think as Christians, 
my conviction anyway is that we need to be able to read these texts through the lens of Christ mm. in order to m- make sense of you know what they ought to mean how we ought to read them mm. and when we see things in the Old Testament that uh, don't necessarily match up with what we see in Christ we then need to ask well what do we do with this text how ought we to read it um, because I don't think throwing those texts out is acceptable I don't think just sort of saying oh well and it's a the word of God or something but we do need to think about what else do we do with um and so you know that and that brings us to questions about like the one we asked earlier about what is judgment what is what does that mean um how do we understand it and and you know why does god expect people to live uh, in a certain way and why might there be a judgment or something like that for living in other ways those are really important questions and they go to issues that you can't I don't think you can just read the Bible on its own and go, oh, well, that's, we, we, we know the answers to all those questions. Cause there's a, there's now 2000 years of, and this is only Christian reflection on all these, mm. uh, you know, theological reflection on all this. Um, and so there's a whole wealth of stuff that we need to be able to dive into. Uh, they're big questions. So Greg, I don't disagree with you at all. No, and Greg, I think, you know, Job tell, he says the same thing as you're saying, really. And I feel as a scientist, there's a whole dark side of God's creation that we don't ever talk about. We yeah. need to. And there's a sense, too, isn't there, in which, um, like, in the bigger picture, like the, the meta narrative of, like, firstly, say, the creation stories, where, you know, God creates this world with certain rules and expectations and this disobedience and consequence. And then you get the covenant narrative, you know, of that, that big story of we're being called to be true, to live within that framework of that covenant. And um, if we don't, then there's consequences. And if we do, then we sort of live in right relationship with God. Yeah, yeah. One of the things I was talking to the group this morning about was the fact that, um, or the, what a fact, I mean, the my, my view, I should say, that um, we... We tend to think of, say, the law as a set of arbitrary rules. Like that's, we tend to think mm. of it like our laws, right? Our laws, they, at, the, at their best, they're there to protect people uh, and to help us do the right thing. But sometimes they seem arbitrary um, as well, uh, or, or they're culturally framed and, and that kind of thing. Um, I think with the law of Israel, it's definitely culturally framed. Um, it's definitely in a particular time, but it's also meant to be in some way a reflection of the character of God for those people at that time. Mm-hmm. And so what this, what they're not saying is here's a bunch of rules that God expects us to keep just because, just to, so God gets a kick out of it. Um, it's about saying this is a reflection of the character of God in this particular moment and this particular time. Now we can point to some of the issues in the text themselves and you know the fact that humans have written them under the inspiration of god in some way but they are human texts um but really what they're saying is this is the pattern of the universe the 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 one who authors the universe is the one who is reflected in these laws that's that's their firm belief and so when they talk about you know not not wanting to turn away from those laws Again, they're not arbitrary in their eyes. What they're saying is this is the pattern of how life actually is. Uh, and if we turn away from that, there are natural consequences for doing that. That's their view, I think. Mm-hmm. No, um, I see it too. Sorry, I just have another question that I was thinking about too, um, just in terms of the covenant. So we said earlier that the... Um, the, the, the big function of the, the prophets was to tell people to, you know, keep track with the covenant and blah, 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 get yeah. that. Um, in for us today, in modern day as Christians, what is the covenant that we have with God? Mm. Or yeah. is it like, do we have, uh, well, I guess we do, but what is it? Like, how do we articulate it? Yeah, so it's a good question. It's, I mean, I'm just <laughs> conscious of the fact that we're over time now. Um, but, uh, I think that we tend to talk about a new covenant, like the one that Jeremiah talks about, like that's a standard Christian way of talking about if, if there's any covenant that we are um, 
that we are in with God, if that's the way we're going to talk about things, it's a new covenant. Um, the terms of that, uh, the terms of that are never really set out explicitly. Okay. Yeah. So it's, you know, you can look at Jeremiah and see aspects of it. Um, we look at Christ and read Paul and we can sort of see the contours of it, but there's never a document that we, that we have been given. This is the covenant, except the new Testament. I mean, that, yeah. I mean, and, and that's kind of the best way I can think of putting it. I mean, the new Testament Testament means covenant, right? I mean, that's really what we're looking at. The, the, the new Testament is in a sense, the covenant document that we have. And it's a document that ultimately testifies to this person of Jesus. I mean, so take that as you, you know, as you will, I guess. Okay, yeah, thanks. Yeah. All right. there's, there's, one, there's one thing that I, I don't know whether other people would, would feel the same way. Wouldn't you like to have been on that road to Emmaus and heard Jesus starting at Moses and the prophets telling all the things in the Old Testament about himself? I, I think what I, I know, like a, a Bible study with Jesus would be great. It'd be much better than a Bible study with a bloke who kind of looks like a white Jesus. I'll tell you what. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> let me um, let um, let me just go to the last question, um, and I'm gonna I'm gonna give you my view, and 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 then you just have to live with it. So the question of what does it mean to be pr prophetic? The reason I raise this question is because. In different Christian traditions today, there are different ideas about what it means to be prophetic. And I want us to be able to think about that and use the language well, because I don't think many Christians do. You have some Christians for whom prophecy is all about a, a word given into, to an individual. It's usually therapeutic in some way. It's usually um, quite individualistic. In some traditions, it's pretty success oriented, like in terms of worldly success. Um, and I, I don't, I, you know, I don't think that's particularly helpful. I'm very open to the idea of words of prophecy being given to people, by the way. I don't think we should shut ourselves off from that. Um, and, that, you know, I'm quite open to miracles and that kind of thing happening, even if they don't happen all that often. Um, but I think that that is not an issue for us in the Uniting Church. I think the greater issue is the way we tend to use the language of prophecy as kind of, um, I, I, the way I said it this morning, uh, and I got big white eyes from Elizabeth, so I'm not sure if she agrees with me or not, but, um, <laughs> but so in, the, in the Uniting Church, we tend to think of prophecy as bold political statements that we agree with. So we say something is prophetic if it was bold and, you know, political or, or you know, quite dramatic, and we agreed with it. Oh, that was prophetic, right? And... <laughs> What I want to suggest is that can be that can definitely be part of the recipe, but I think a crucial part of the recipe too, as we see in these prophets, is that they 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 really believe, uh, and I think that they are um, proclaiming and transmitting God's word to us. They're communicating something from God, and um, I just. I guess what I'd want to say is I don't want to lose that aspect of how we talk about the prophetic in the Uniting Church. I just don't want to, I don't want to trade uh, the, the genuinely prophetic in for um, just kind of, a, you know, a bold kind of political presence. It can include that. And obviously the prophets are often that, right? But it, I just want to, I want to make clear that I think it's more than that as well. I did not make large eyes at yeah. you when you said that this morning. Matt you just imagined that. <laughs> I'm glad well, if I imagined it, that's even better. So. <laughs> Look, folks, we're 10 minutes over time, so I'm going to leave it there. It's really, it's been lovely to be with you. Um, I'm appreciative of um, the questions and just keeping the thing moving. And I'm sorry that we just didn't have more time to explore what were some really excellent questions. Well, it's a very Thank large you, topic. It and is. we're not going to cover it all. So thank you very much, Matt, for being with the group tonight. Yeah. I'm sure they've got a lot out of it and they've appreciated um, your wisdom and your insight mm. and uh, you sharing your knowledge about the prophets. No, thank it's you. been a pleasure. Thank, thank you, you Matt. folks. Have a good evening. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Right. you too, Matt. See you later. Yeah. Yeah. See, see you. Yeah. See you. Bye. Bye.